This is April Fernando. I am uh, from the Prade Foundation and the Center for Innovation and Population Health at the University of Kentucky. And um, before we get started, I just want to put out a little disclaimer. Um, we're going to be talking, as Joanne said, about the use of phone conferencing and video conferencing in the CFT process, as well as in implementing and utilizing the CANs. And while we may address some issues that are pertinent to the delivery of care via telehealth, in no way is this a presentation on how to provide services via telehealth. So um, I would encourage you, if you want more information about providing services via telehealth, to please check with your licensing boards and professional ethical guidelines for your discipline. So if I can get the next slide, Robin. Um, so here are the new realities of our world and life work, and I don't need to belabor this because we are living it uh, as we speak. Um, and it might seem like um, our realities of our uh, life right now, whether it's work or just our personal lives, um, are antithetical to collaboration, particularly the type of collaboration that's required to do our work well with kids and families. Um, and that type of collaboration is also critical for a communimetric tool like the CANS. Um, it doesn't mean that we actually have to stop collaborating, which is what we're going to talk about today. So, in fact, the teaming process itself may not necessarily change that much, although the vehicle in which we team might actually change. And the um, the time and the de deliberateness um, at which we go about teaming might be quite different, right? So um, next slide. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, I have a next slide, Robin? Can we use technology to maintain our connections, collaboration, and continue to support kids and families, right? Um, because, um, as much as we want to keep safe, we want to keep supporting the kids and families um, and help them be safe as well. So we have to find other means to do that. So with that, I'm going to turn this over back to Joanne. Thank you, April. And I realized I hadn't introduced myself. I'm Joanne Pritchard, and I work with the Central California Training Academy in a variety of capacities. And one of the things that uh, one of the things that I focus on is child and family team teaming, um, and developing curriculum around that. And so um, I'm happy to be able to to talk with all of you today. Uh, so next slide, Robin. When we are thinking about uh, we're thinking about child and family teams, we really want people to focus on this as a process rather than an event. And this is something that we have really been trying to stress throughout the curriculum um, and in different conversations with people. Um, so we have to really remember that this is about engaging the team to support safety and well-being of the children. And we actually have an opportunity here um, by using technology such as video conferencing or phone conferencing for the actual meeting to possibly create some additional flexibility for attendees who might be participating. Um, historically, we have set up the meetings and asked people to come at specific times. And sometimes those, those days and times work for some people, but not all people. And by allowing people to participate remotely, we might be able to eliminate some of those possible barriers that are associated with scheduling and transportation, uh, just because people don't have to get on the bus to get to a meeting or um, have to travel a long distance in order to be able to attend. And so we wanna see this as a way to continue to engage with children and families and also their team. Next slide, please. So one of the key pieces for thinking through how to provide um, or to continue to maintain child and family team meetings during this time is really um, planning ahead. This is a focus no matter whether we are doing this virtually or if we're doing this in person. And it's something that we know um, can sometimes be a challenge um, for some uh, for scheduling at times. And so what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that folks have an idea of what they need to plan ahead for and some special considerations. 
So the format and the structure of the meeting should be determined ahead of time. So figuring out whether or not this is going to be a conference call, a video conference, um, making sure that everyone who is being invited to participate in the meeting has access to the technology that we're asking them to use. Uh, so this requires us to ask ahead of time, um, what do you have access to? How could we help you? Addressing barriers possibly um, to enable them to be able to participate. Also thinking about privacy considerations. Um, so we will need to make sure that infra share, information sharing during the child and family teams, whether it is um, virtual or um, in person, that we are still meeting the requirements of the releases of information and confidentiality. Uh, so we need to make sure that we're anticipating each person's ability to access the technology for the meeting and their ability to be able to keep the information that we'll be talking about private. So some of the things to think about are um, prior to the meeting, um, you really do want to make sure privacy is being addressed. And so you could do this through just asking some questions of the participants. Is there a quiet space for you to have the meeting? If participating by video, is there a private area so that others are not able to see the screen or information being shared on the screen? Is it possible to have earphones for the audio? Um, so again, just really wanting to make sure we are honoring the family's privacy around their information and not um, inadvertently sharing that with others um, just because we are participating in multiple locations. So next slide, please. So another thing to think about is using our trauma lens to help think about what are some other things that we should anticipate <clears throat> or plan for with these meetings. We know that we are experiencing that children and families are experiencing separation and maybe some disconnects regarding visitation at this time, um, or that their visitation may not be happening in the way that it had been before. So we wanna make sure we've paid attention to that, as well as acknowledging and understanding what are some of the environmental stressors that might be happening now that are a little bit different um, than maybe had been, the team had been experiencing before. And also just knowing that there are gonna be some sensitive topics that people might feel are harder to talk about when we're not in person. Um, so we have to make sure that um, if a child and parent have not been able to visit, but they're gonna be seeing each other via video conferencing, that we're anticipating that this could be emotional for them and that we're being especially attuned um, to possible trauma triggers when we're conducting these meetings virtually. So a lot of times, again, we ask that question, how many times do our observations inform our assessments? Same thing when we're in meetings. If you're facilitating a meeting, you're paying attention to body language, you're paying attention to how people are reacting um, in their moment in the room. Uh, maybe it is just uh, simply the way that they have, they're looking or they've gotten quiet. And those things are a lot harder to read if we are doing things over the phone or by video conferencing. So we wanna make sure we're trying to pay attention to any other physical indicators. If you are using video that you're being especially attuned to that. Um, and also just maybe checking in to find out, you know, how are people doing? Because it's gonna be more difficult to determine if people are starting to become distressed. Um, and be able to redirect the conversation. And then with the topics that might already be sensitive or difficult to talk about, this could be, feel, this could be really overwhelming um, if people's stress level is already high. So if it's already heightened due to other things that are happening in the community, such as uh, feeling isolated, um, maybe there's resource issues, not having the things that they need, this may be causing them additional anxiety and the way that I kind of think about it is like if you are already kind of at a simmer and if that like the community stressors are kind of that thing that maybe puts us in this simmering category, it doesn't take much for things to boil over. And so just know that if there are some sensitive topics or things that have to be talked about, that may be the thing that kind of puts people over the edge. And so we want to be aware of that and how are we going to have those conversations. Next slide. Another important piece to this is making sure that we are connecting with people on a human or a personal level before we dive into agenda setting and content. For those of you who have been participating in meetings in the last week and a half to two weeks virtually, um, 
some of you may have experienced a, a check-in, just a brief check-in of like, how is everyone doing? Just personally, how are you doing? Because we recognize that this is hard for us. Um, we are used to being in a lot of contact with one another. And so the quarantining is held, has made that a little bit more challenging and is causing some stress for folks and giving people an opportunity to talk about that and to share their experiences really helps us to just connect and build community with each other. Um, let's see here. So connecting with people during this uncertain time can help your meeting go a little bit more smoothly. Um, the facilitator can ask the question how everyone is doing. They could also consider doing like an opening question that just is a little bit lighter and helps to um, facilitate that connection prior to getting into any of the information that needs to be talked about in regards to the child and the family. Um, asking some questions like, is there anything we need to know about? Is there anything we would need from each other to feel supported today? So we would wanna make sure we start there. Also make some accommodations for the technology glitches and delays that may happen. Um, so being aware that sometimes people might be on mute and aren't being heard. Um, there also might be some things like with internet connection or availability, uh, depending on how you're facilitating the meeting. So how are you planning for that? What are the ways that you're going to make sure people stay connected or if someone drops off, what is the plan at that point? You also wanna make some group agreements for virtual meetings and think about some special considerations like is the camera gonna be on or off? Um, is note taking gonna be happening? Um, what is the expectation for participation? I'm sure all of you have participated in webinars where sometimes a question is asked and um, there's pretty much silence on the other end. And so this can happen during virtual meetings as well. And so we wanna make sure that we have some agreements about how are we going to participate with one another? How can we assume best intentions for one another um, when it might be more difficult to be answering questions and not to interpret silence as someone is upset, but perhaps they're thinking or they just need another moment to be able to respond. So how are we able to accommodate for that? Also, if you are gonna have a rule about cameras um, being on or off, making sure that that applies to everyone or that there is a reason for someone not being on camera if it, the expectation is for that to happen. The other thing is you wanna make sure you're taking your time and providing opportunities for people to speak and respond. And again, sometimes on conference calling, people may talk over one another, not because they're trying to be rude or um, they're trying to interrupt. There's just sometimes a little bit of a lag when we're doing this um, virtually. And so being aware of that and providing extra opportunities for people to comment and weigh in on things that have been talked about. So, next slide. And then one of the other things that we need to do is to make sure that the purpose of the meeting is really clear to everyone. Why are we coming together to have this conversation today? When you're setting the agenda, when while we are in this current climate and um, we are dealing with shelter in place and other issues, um, we may not be able to get through as many of the usual meeting items as we had in the past, because there might actually be some immediate needs of the family um, that need to be addressed based on current circumstances versus future planning. So if our plan is to get there to talk about the case plan, but the family is really struggling in their own personal day-to-day -day, um, functioning, we would need to address that. And so we just have to be patient and we also have to make some accommodations for how are we going to still pay attention to the long-term goals, but also knowing that in the short term, we may need to do that as part of crisis intervention for right now. And we wanna make sure that the focus of this conversation is on the immediate needs of the children and families. Um, that's, so next slide, please. Okay. And so when we're talking about information sharing, again, this is something that you can talk about as part of your group agreements, but um, determining ahead of time, if you are ut utilizing video conferencing, will you be utilizing a screen sharing um, option? Um, if so, who has the permission to do the screen sharing? For charting, how are you going to be collecting the information? noting things that are working well or things that um, might be worrisome and also next steps. Um, so will that be done on shared screen? Is that gonna be done in a Word doc, on a Google doc, whatever it is? 
Um, and then also planning for confidentiality of how will this information be shared once we are done. Some considerations for this is if you are a facilitator who maybe is not is working on your own personal um, device and you're sharing your screen or taking the notes, how is it that you're going to get that information back out to anybody? Um, how are you going to store that information and take that information back off of a personal device? So it's just kind of thinking about those things ahead of time. And also with conference calling, because you don't have the ability of being able to see the screen or tracking information in that way, how will charting be done? How will people be able to um, get an understanding of what were some of the main things that were talked about or captured here? And then also, how would the action plan be sent back out? Is that going to be by email? Is it going to be um, is it going to be by mail? And also, how do you make sure that the action plan that is identified is what everyone has talked about? And so, making sure that you're reviewing that and rereading that back to everyone to make sure that there is clarity and understanding and agreement with everyone. And so, with that, I will uh, turn it over to April unless there are questions. All right, um, just to start off to let you know that the CANS has been used in telehealth um, for phone uh, screening as well as assessment um, uh, and also through video conferencing for some time. And as I mentioned before, um, the heart of a communometric tool such as the CANS is collaboration and consensus building. And so we do need to make sure that we take time to allow those processes to happen, which might require us to be a little bit more deliberate about how we make those processes happen when we're using the phone or a video conference platform. I have the next slide. So whether we're talking about um, our assessment process or we're updating the CANs, I think it, or we're preparing the family, um, the young people for a child and family team. I think it's important um, for all of our staff, whether they're clinicians or social workers, um, case managers, or CFT facilitators, to remember to um, explain what the CANS is about um, so that families know how to participate in the process, they understand what the action levels are. Um, and that if we're using uh, a video conferencing, that we use visuals as much as possible to help explain what the CAMS is and how the action levels work. If they're able to see something on a screen, we might as well take advantage of that screen so that we can help them understand the process better. Next slide, please. Um, it's important to take time to prepare um, all the family members um, as to how the CANS is going to be used in a meeting, right? Whether it's a meeting with a clinician or a meeting with a child and family team, um, the CANS has this way of concentrating information in those items. And so we need to make sure that we help them understand uh, and remember, right, the process in which we uh, went about rating the items, understanding which items are identified for um, areas of support, how we're going to use the strength and to talk about this with the family and the young people before we actually have a meeting where we're going to talk about those aspects of their lives. And so sensitive issues, as Joanne mentioned earlier, need to be discussed and we need to have uh, come up with strategies, whether they're visual cues, um, on video conference or verbal signals that the family, the young people know that they can use to say, hey, um, it's a little bit too much, I need a break, or I need some support, right? And so we need to um, plan for those things ahead of time so that we can support young people and uh, caregivers during the meeting time. Next slide. Um, while we're listening to the family story, whether it's the first time or a subsequent time, I think it's important that we um, be deliberate about building consensus and making sure that we all 
understand what's happening and we have a shared understanding of what's happening. So we need to talk about the impact of um, needs and strengths on individuals and the people around them and the action levels are a great way to do that. So some suggestions that I have here on the slide are, sounds like this is an area where you could use some help, which would be a two or this seems like it's a priority area for some support, which might be a three, or for a strength, that sounds like something that's been a real source of support for you. Again, deliberately identifying um, where supports are needed and where strengths are. Next slide, please. We're gonna have disagreements when we're um, having team meetings, right? And it might be that we do disagree on where areas of support could be beneficial to young people or to the family. And so we do need to take the time to identify when we're having different perspectives and our disagreement is maybe stalling us from being able to move forward or make a decision. So we need to focus again on the impact. Those action levels can be really helpful right and say it out loud so something like it seems like you young person may not think that this is such a big deal but your basketball coach just spoke about how this is impacting your attendance and your health can we talk about this further right to take a moment to pause to acknowledge the differences in perspectives and try together to come to some understanding and as much as possible if you can chart uh, those differing perspectives, either if you're on video conference, do a flip chart and write things down or put it on a screen or on a whiteboard. But you want to be able to capture in a way where you can bring it back in at a subsequent meeting and go over it again, identifying everyone's differing perspectives so that you can come to some better understanding. This also helps with engagement with young people in particular because they know that you're listening to them. So coming to consensus is important because we need to be on the same page as we move forward. Next slide, please. When we're looking at our action plan, right, it's important that we get the perspective of the family and the, the family members on how that action plan is working for them, right? So take the time to ask each person and listen to their response right they may bring up things that are coming up that have nothing to do with the action plan particularly nowadays with our public health crisis there may be other things that are more important to them and so we need to make space and take time for that as joanne mentioned earlier again if you're using a technology where uh, sharing a screen is available you might want to use visuals to look at the plan and to look at changes on the plan this is where the cans can be really helpful if you have it integrated into your planning process so you can look at changes in those ratings over time next slide please and when you're reviewing the plan the visual can help in developing consensus right identifying those things that are going well and progress is being made as well as identifying places where the plan may not be working as well and coming to consensus as a team as to how you might go about adjusting or optimizing the plan so that it can um, work better and the family can engage in the plan better. So those are just some things that we thought might be helpful. If you have any questions, we're happy to uh, um, address them now. And I just want to note that the resources that are here on the page are really helpful. Um, NCCD has already put out some information um, about resources for child welfare and justice agencies, um, talking about like how to make the best out of video conferences or video visits. Um, they also, um, so I don't know if you want to click on that, um, Robin, or just kind of let that to be for folks to explore on their own, but. Um, yeah, that one, the top one, <laughs> um, because this actually has a lot of really great resources around um, like how do you prepare for the meeting, like how can you do some of these visits. Um, so just right here, um, so you if you scroll down just a little bit, you'll see that there are several. So you've got the safety assessment and planning during 
uh, physical distancing, successful video visits with young children, supervision during physical distancing, and then family and team meetings. Um, so the family and team meetings, I'll be honest, that one has um, just come up online from yesterday into today, so I haven't had a chance to review it. But this is a site that I would uh, recommend continuing to go back to and just seeing what additional resources they have. Um, and then we'll also be doing our best to kind of interpret um, some of the resources that they're providing down to a county or regional level um, to answer questions that folks may have. Thank you, Robin. I just said this is just a really wonderful resource for people to access um, and to keep checking back to see if there are additional tools and, and um, things that are available to them. All right, April and Joanne, do I have you here? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Perfect. Uh, I guess one of the questions that we have here is, will there be training opportunities for staff to learn and develop these skills? Is there already a curriculum somewhere in California that can use as a model? My concerns would be great with regards to fidelity. Is the question in regards to facilitation, do you know? Or is it around the camp? It appears so. Okay. So in regards to the um, CFT facilitation training, that is um, some training that is in process. Um, I should say the curriculum development is in process. And I know Lisa had earlier mentioned that the pilot has been um, postponed. So um, we don't have a date for one that would be going live yet. Um, but we would be able to provide um, I guess some other handouts if there were like things specifically that people were um, we're wanting or needing in regards to child and family team meeting facilitation during this time. Um, a lot of the same things would apply regarding model fidelity, just as far as like, how do you conduct the meeting? What are some of the things um, you're attending to? Um, how are you ensuring that um, safety and um, needs and strengths of the family are all being addressed, um, depending on where the family is at within the system? Um, so there are some uh, resources for that that we could make available. They would not be specific to virtual facilitation, but they should still be able to apply to the virtual facilitation. Thank you. And I just want to be mindful of time. So I know we generally end the webinars at 1130. So if people are hopping off, I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us today. These uh, webinars are being recorded. You should receive an email um, with the link um, so you can always follow up if you have to hop off and want to hear the um, the remainder of these questions, since we're going to run a little bit past. So thank you to everyone. And thank you, Joanne and April, for being flexible as well. There are a few questions on here um, about ensuring confidentiality. Are Zoom and GoToMeeting secure? It seems that Zoom has had some confidentiality, um, they may have had some confidentiality breaches recently. Um, this is April. I was just uh, reading a um, listserv uh, for the California Psychology Association, Psychological Association, and um, GoToMeeting just released some information around it being secure. Um, for Zoom, so it's all about um, secure uh, on both ends of a call. For Zoom, you can set that um, Specifically, you have to set it though. It's if the default is not to have end-to-end -end security, so you just go into your settings and you can set it. Okay, great. And we did have a couple um, questions that looked like there were more for the group, and we had a response that I was going to read out loud, and then we'll come back. Um, the questions were: Any experience on how families are currently experiencing remote child and family team meetings? And what are some options others have used to overcome lack of technology? We received a response from Shelly Paul, who had to jump off the call at 11, um, but she wanted us to make sure people had the information. She said that um, San Diego, she, Shelly Paul's with San Diego County, and she said that their county CFT facilitation contract has been doing virtual meetings for the past few weeks, and they have been very successful. They are using the Conference Now app, 
which has up to 12 people allowed. Uh, they are doing customized team agreements, including raising their hand on the screen, et cetera. Scheduling is much easier to coordinate, and they have the same number of, ten of attendees. They've actually been very surprised and impressed with how well these meetings are going. Um, and she said she's available for questions if people um, have any, but unfortunately she did have to hop off at 11. I see Sophia has mentioned it would be wonderful if an e-learning could be created for staff to learn this information, tips for how to engage through video conferencing, how to use visuals, how to apply current skills within this new form of service delivery. And Joanne, you might be able to speak to that a little bit, but I believe there is something currently in development. Is that correct? Um, well, I think for the an e-learning around this, um, we have talked about it um, between the regional training academies and we would like to put something together um, to give a little bit of direction to counties. Um, it has really been more of a discussion at this point. I don't know that there are, I don't know that we have like a date for when that would be available. Um, right now, I think we're just trying to figure out like what are the resources that we collectively have and how can we pull those together to uh, meet the needs of counties throughout the state so that we're not duplicating efforts and you know all working on something separately. Um, I do think that the information that we have from today's presentation would be able to transition pretty well into an e-learning that we would be able to have offered. So I don't have a date, but I do think we would be able to get working on that fairly quickly. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and are there examples of the visuals that can be used during CANS and CFT, CAN slash CFT meetings? Um, uh, depending on which visual, the action levels, um, there are visuals that a lot of counties are using. Um, in terms of the uh, changes in the plans and the CANS items linked to the action plans, um, that's a different matter. Um, it might, I think there's an individual level report in CARES that can be used, um, but um, given that the counties are not all using the same systems, particularly between behavioral health and child welfare, it's hard for me to recommend um, what those look like, but those that have systems that produce individual reports with change over time, um, those are things that I can recommend. I can share some recommended reports, but I also don't want to frustrate people if they don't have them available to them. I would just add that most of the documentation that um, we've tried a little bit is mostly like through mapping. Um, so if your county is familiar with safety organized practice or just with the process of mapping, kind of the what's working well, what are we worried about, what needs to happen next, um, that can pretty easily be done on a shared screen, um, just in a Word document that can then be emailed out. So um, I, I'm sure we could come up with some templates that uh, might be helpful for folks, but um, it's a pretty base, we're using just a pretty basic um, three column map along with a um, identified next steps and who would be doing what. That's how I've seen it work, but we could probably provide some additional guidance if there was if that was um, needed. Great. And I see there are some people asking for the contact information for Shelley Paul from San Diego County. If you would like that information, just email us at cwscoordination at dss.ca.gov. Again, that email address is on the bottom of the agenda as well, but it's cwscoordination at dss.ca.gov, and we can help connect you. Okay, back to Joanne and April. How would you recommend completing a CANS assessment using telehealth if the family does not have technology other than phone? Um, that's a great question, and um, I actually forgot to mention that it's probably a good idea for all of us to think that the um, most common technology, um, not just with the families we work with, but with our staff who are not using, uh, who are not given laptops, for example, is a phone. 
And um, while most people have smartphones and many of the video conferencing technologies can be used with smartphones, um, you sometimes have to assume that they don't have the bandwidth to handle a, a video conferencing session. So I think what is the most helpful, again, is to go slowly through what the CANS is, how the action levels work, and be very deliberate when you're talking to them. If you can send them, um, CDSS has put together a one-pager on the CANS that has the action levels that can be really helpful to send to them ahead of time um, so that they have something to look at while you're talking to them. And again, stopping as you're listening to the story to um, highlight those areas you hear or might, might be areas where they could use support and building consensus, that would be the way to do it, right? So it's not much different than how you would do it in person, except you don't have visual cues to help you. So you have to be more deliberate. And you might have to explain, particularly to young people, why you're asking so many questions that you normally wouldn't, because you don't have visual cues to help you with the process. You're always having to just listen to what's being said and having to verbalize something if you're not clear. Thank you. And can you both speak to um, concerns about safety and privacy when there's intimate partner violence or domestic violence when holding a virtual child and family team meeting? So I will just say that, again, following some of the same guidelines that you would in any other child and family team meeting, uh, where if you are utilizing, um, if you're utilizing a virtual setting, um, you would not want to have um, the uh, person, like the perpetrator, as well as the um, survivor participating at the same time. Those would still need to be separate meetings, just as um, you would, as you would do it now, even if it was in person. Um, so you would definitely want to be following any of the um, court orders for protection. Um, and also, um, these would also be additional times to make sure that you're checking in with participants ahead of time, um, identifying any possible um, issues regarding safety and what we would need to attend to. I know that we do not have um, a very, I don't think there's a specific protocol put out there yet. I want to say there was there's some information, I believe, on the NCCD website um, from Safe and Together. And um, I'm sure we, again, we can pull some of those things down and maybe put out like a one pager of best practice or things to consider. Uh, but there are some resources through Safe and Together that I'm familiar with. That's, but that's all I could say about that right now. Great, thank you. Uh, regarding CANS, what if a youth refuses to share his or her CANS virtually? Are, do you have any suggestions? Um, that is uh, a great question because you need to anticipate that. And I think it's really about um, getting familiar with the fact that the CANS is not about the tool. It's about the young person. So they may not want to share their ratings, but you can still talk about what's going on with them. And um, as long as you understand that, you know, an area where, where something is impacting their daily life is at least a two and is something that could probably use some support and you can talk to them that way, then you're fine, you know, right? It's really not about the cans. The cans just captures the information. It's really talking about what's going on with the young person. So I think it's about um, learning those engagement skills, particularly with um, teens and older youth um, so that uh, they realize that you're concerned about them and you're not just trying to gather information um, you'll be better off and just translate all that into the cans. And um, if you've built consensus as you're talking to them, right? Sounds like this is something you could use some help on. Yeah, that is something I could use help on, right? Then you're actually doing it in a communometric way. Thank you. And Joanne, uh, I've got questions. How can I get my name added to the CFT training email list once it is rescheduled? Uh, I would say to contact the, your, um, your regional training academy. So 
wherever you're located, whether that's Southern or um, Bay Area, Central or Northern, um, I would reach out to those contacts and you're also welcome to email me and I can um, get your information to the right person. So as long as I know your county um, and your role, I'd be able to get you connected to someone at your regional training academy.